Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. While India is creating wealth at a furious pace and women are starting to bridge the gap with men, this is the finding of a report released by Kotak and Huran Research Institute, which has ranked India's top 100 wealthiest women in the country. Leading the list is Smita V. Krishna of the Godrej Group, a member of the board of Godrej. She has a net worth of over 37,500 crore rupees. That's right at the top. At number two is HCL's Roshni Nadar with a net worth of over 30,000 crore rupees. And Indu Jain of the Bennett Coleman Group comes in at number Number three, Kiran Shaw of Biocon, Kiran Nadar of HCL complete the top five. At number six, we've got Lina Tiwari of the USV Group. She is also an MLA in Uttar Pradesh representing the Apna Dal. Now, 22% of India's top 100 wealthy women come in from the pharma sector. 12% are from the software and services space. Food and beverages, chemicals and automobiles are also among the top sectors where women have managed to create wealth. When it comes to companies, Infosys and Avenue Supermart have produced 10 out of India's 100 richest women. Intas Pharma, Asian Paints, Microlabs complete the list of top five companies. Geographically, Delhi and Mumbai are home to 50% of the top 100 richest women in the country, followed by Bengaluru, Ahmedabad, and Hyderabad. Joining us now uh, to take us through the findings, uh, Jaydeep from Kotak and Anas from Huron. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here uh, on the show. Let me start by asking you about the omissions and why we've actually seen those omissions. I know that you've put in a lot of work into this report, Jaydeep, but you know we don't have politicians, we don't have sports stars, we don't have Bollywood representation. Uh, it's largely corporate, both listed as well as unlisted entities that find themselves, or women that find themselves in this report. I think I will take that question. Uh, when we value the uh, net worth of individuals in the report, uh, we only go by verifiable data uh, that is uh, that is valid. So we might have missed a few on a few individuals. What I normally say is, for every one person who we identified, we probably miss another uh, uh, another one. So the actual list, the size of the list, should be probably 200 or 300. Uh, but uh, what we're trying to do here is to talk about some of the most successful uh, uh, the stories of uh, companies that have a significant ownership by women. You know, what I always say is you know, creating wealth is fantastic, but when it's created transparently, it uh, gives a lot of respect. So uh, we've tried to create an inaugural list. Maybe next year we would expand it and possibly look at more such uh, 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 companies or entrepreneurs who we've missed. But this is the inaugural list and this is the, uh, okay. we looked at verifiable data that is uh, valid legally. Uh, understood. So let me then ask you, uh, you know, what is the gap that you're seeing between uh, women who have inherited wealth on account of being part of the promoter family, etc., and self-made women? So women entrepreneurs, what's the gap in this list today? And where do you see that headed over the next few years? I think when we started the uh, uh, <coughs> India Rich List, uh, um, as you rightly mentioned, when you uh, open the conversation. When we started the India Rich List about five years back, we could only find four women in the India Rich List. You no, know, put self-made and inherited put together, uh, from uh, possibly one self-made and three inherited. But from there, we've expanded to um, uh, possibly 100 to 120, uh, which would be in the latest list that we'll put out in a uh, uh, India Rich List that we'll put out in uh, in a month's time or a couple of months' time. Uh, so, number of self-made entrepreneurs in India has drastically increased. If I have to put a percentage, it will be probably a few thousands of percentage from an Indian rich list uh, perspective. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, self-made entrepreneurs have gone drastically. And, uh, of course, India still are in uh, very similar to possibly uh, one comparable economy like China, which is about 10, 15 years back, wherein women are uh, inheriting businesses but getting actively involved as well. Uh, there is a significant gap right now, but this gap is bound to reduce as more and more uh, women uh, get into entrepreneurship, as more and more uh, 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 you know, women possibly uh, start raising funds, take the company to uh, the next level in terms of value creation. So that's all bound to happen. So the gap is definitely reducing, though. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'd like to add one more thing. Yeah, go ahead, Jadeep. Yeah. Uh, the thing which I would like to add is that, uh, uh, yes, there would be... Uh, women who might have inherited the wealth, uh, but there is a significant portion of that which are now taking the company to different levels. 
so I would not, uh, yes, of course, uh, there would be a clear cut differentiation between uh, people who've uh, uh, inherited and people who've uh, started uh, the, the, the uh, organizations of the firms. But I think ladies who've inherited the, the wealth and have now taken it to different levels, I see that uh, uh, growing significantly in the next few years as well. Okay, I see somebody like Indira Nui on the list as well, uh, uh, and, and that would uh, be because in your report you identify Indians or define them only as Indians who have been born or brought up in India, right? So that's why somebody like an Indira Nui makes it to this list. That's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, we were, yes. talking, we were talking about the India-China comparison as well. Uh, what's the picture like as far as China is concerned today? And we were talking about the gap uh, in India between inherited wealth uh, as well as uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, what's the comparison if you, if you make that comparison with China today? Um, I will probably add on a couple of more statistics uh, than just talking about inherited and self-made because that story is going to uh, change anyway uh, for sure. In, from a China rich list uh, perspective, 70% of the list is self-made uh, and the number two is the average wealth uh, per an individual in the China rich list vis-a-vis -vis India rich list. In the China rich list, the average wealth of a women individual in the rich list is around 6,500 crores. In India, it's around uh, 4,000 uh, crores. Right? So there's a difference there. Um, uh, then the next thing is on the geographical spread. If you look at the uh, uh, India rich list or the possibly the women representation in the list, it's very concentrated on few cities. Uh, but in a country like China, it's very well spread out. So that is quite interesting. In fact, the, the richest women individual in China is not from Beijing or Shanghai, it's from Guangzhou. No, it's like saying it's not from Mumbai or Delhi, it's from you know, Hyderabad or Bangalore. You know? uh, so, uh, so, so, that's, so that spread is uh, very much there mm. in China. And also the next thing is about the industry trends. Um, in India, it's pharma, but in China, it's core sectors like manufacturing. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the richest people in China was in the top 10 who's worth 24 billion US, she's from real estate. Okay. You know, I haven't seen a top uh, women real estate entrepreneur yet from India but to that scale. Mm. So there's, there's few differences from a sectoral and uh, uh, sectoral perspective, but that's all bound to change. You know, in, uh, in possibly five or six years, you're seeing a lot more uh, tech companies which is, mm. uh, uh, which is uh, enabling, uh, which, which is coming in India. You know, and then that, or you would see a couple, two, three more unicorns in India, and the list is only bound to grow as year passes by. You now it's very similar to India. It says when we started, it was a hundred people list. It became six seventy-five, six fifty people right. list uh, end of uh, uh, two thousand seventeen. Similarly, the women rich list will also possibly double or triple in uh, two, three years time. Well, we certainly hope that that is the case. But Jaydeep, let me ask you about other insights. Uh, you know, in terms of how these women are actually spending their wealth, uh, I know that you've done some work in this report on the kind of money that's being allocated towards CSR and in within CSR, the areas that they are spending their money on. Uh, have you been able to draw any parallels between how the women are spending their money and what the, uh, uh, what the men are doing? Actually, not uh, not too much of difference uh, in, in that. Uh, uh, what I've seen, uh, uh, having been in this space uh, uh, for quite some time, uh, is uh, uh, I, I, I always see a difference between uh, the way the women manage businesses and the way women manage the wealth which is created from these businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, my experience in this has been that when women are managing businesses, they're as aggressive or as forthright or, or uh, as the male counterparts would be. Uh, having said that, when it comes to the investment bit, I uh. think uh, there is a bit of conservatism which one sees. So they're, they're more uh, risk averse when, when, uh, when it comes to when it comes to investing their money. Uh, yes, uh, and 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 the way I look at it uh, is that uh, you know when uh, you take risks in your business, it's not necessary that you take risks in your investments. Uh, because at least one portion of the, the the piece needs to be needs to be far more conservative than the mm. other, and that's what I've seen. Uh, uh, if one were to 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 look at a, a a difference as to how they they, okay. they manage their wealth and manage their businesses. And ask any interesting insights on how they're spending their money. Uh, can I add one point? Yes, there? please. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So I want to uh, uh, extend from what Jairib just said. 
there are essentially three stakeholders from uh, women entrepreneurship uh, perspective and um, I'm sure there are a lot of survey reports and uh, which says that if the gender uh, parity, if India's gender parity is uh, 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 in terms of uh, women working in the workforce, it increases from 30 to 40 percent. Mm. By 2025, that alone would add an additional GDP of 700 billion US. Mm. That's additional 1.4 percent every year in terms of GDP growth, right? Now, for, there's another survey by World Bank which says that um, uh, women-led companies or women-owned companies tend to employ more women. So women entrepreneurship is absolutely the need of the hour mm. and success of women entrepreneurship stories are really needed for not just for women empowerment but also for the overall growth of India. You know, it's, it's as serious as that. Um, uh, so I, I would say there are three stakeholders who should possibly help them achieve this growth in wealth creation. Wealth creation, the first is of course the government through the policies, mm. then uh, investors who should possibly support or back uh, women-led ventures, and third is wealth managers like Jaideep who should possibly help uh, uh, these entrepreneurs make mm. the prudent decisions when it comes to uh, allocating their asset or investments. Um, so that I, I really want to convey the role of yeah. a wealth manager also play uh, oh, in, in this ecosystem. Uh, absolutely, um, I, 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 think, I think that's spending, a very important point that yeah, you make, so, Anas. But just before you get into spending, if I could ask you a quick question, because you said that uh, you know it's necessary that we have more women entrepreneurs uh, and more women-owned companies. But do you, uh, you know, through the course of of your uh, study here in India or in other geographies, do you tend to notice that the markets perhaps treat women? owned businesses differently uh, I don't um, um, I, I haven't seen any negative way of treating you know uh, uh, any such company I haven't seen anything negative in that I've only seen positive aspects I think uh, uh, from my perspective uh, I think women are much better managers than men when it comes to running their businesses <laughs> so uh, so I really think that uh, if at all the market should perceive women-led business. It should be uh, led, uh, you know, perceived positively and not anything else. I haven't heard any other stories. Okay. Um, uh, having said that, uh, yeah. So that, that that's one thing. And then, yeah. On the spending. A spending bit. I think uh, um, it's interesting. They are also uh, the women entrepreneurs or achievers or owners or wealth creators are also very active. Uh, I know for a fact that some of the entrepreneurs are actively investing into tech businesses. Uh, some of them have exited from their previous businesses and uh, creating new ventures. Uh, there are quite a few entrepreneurs who are very active in art-based investments, okay. not as an investment, promoting art right. in itself. Right. Uh, uh, there are quite, uh, quite a few women entrepreneurs who are very mm. uh, uh, focused on uh, social uh, activities like mm. you know, uh, 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 social redevelopment and so right. on. So they're very, very active uh, in terms of spending money in both passion, investment, and as well as philanthropy. Okay, uh, Jaydeep, I'll end then by asking you, any asset classes that uh, uh, women uh, uh, prefer uh, uh, in your assessment? I would, I would uh, put uh, fixed income as a, as a preferred uh, uh, destination for women than, uh, than uh, the equity space, uh, which uh, maybe correlates with my earlier answer that yes. uh, uh, they are uh, uh, slightly more risk averse when it comes to investment. So I'd say fixed income. Uh, would be would be uh, my answer to that. Well, all right, Jaydeep Panas, uh, thanks very much for joining us and sharing your perspective on the Kotak Wealth uh, Leading Wealthy Women 2018 report. It's the inaugural report, 100 women being listed here, and we hope that that number does grow exponentially in the years to come. Thanks very much for your time and appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Three cities in Maharashtra, Pune, Navi Mumbai and Mumbai are the most livable places in the country and that's according to the Ease of Living Index that was released by the Urban Development Ministry earlier today. The index ranks a total of 111 cities based on four key parameters, governance, economic factors, social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. So where do other metros stand when compared to the maximum city? Chennai comes in 14th on the list, 
Bengaluru comes in a distant 58 and New Delhi, meanwhile, is ranked at 65. Kolkata did not participate in the index and a quick check of the Hall of Shamers as well. Rampur in UP is the worst performing city on the Ease of Living Index, followed by Kohima. Three cities from Bihar, that's uh, the capital Patna, along with Bihar Sharif and Bhagalpur, complete the bottom five. CNBC TV 18's Timzi Jaikpuria caught up with the Minister of State for Housing and Urban Affairs, Hardeep Singh Puri. Here's a slice of that chat. Today we are joined by Urban Affairs Minister Hardeep Singh Puri. Sir, very welcome to join to CNBC TV 18. So today you launched a very critical index that is the most livable index telling out which are the top 10 livable cities across various social parameters. So if you can give us the which are the top five cities and on what basic parameters of all parameters are on which these I, are ranked. I, I, I like your use of word critical. Look, I've been saying for a long time, it's the duty of the state, it's the duty of the government to provide ease of living to its citizens. I think we are the first government in independent India, uh, and after in, in our 71st year, we would say with great pride that we want our citizens to judge the quality of their living through an ease of living index. It's an empirical index. So your question of which are the top five, Pune, Navi Mumbai, Greater Mumbai, Tirupati, and Chandigarh. Uh, we've declared the top 10. We've de declared all of the cities. We've declared the basis in which, uh, 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 you know, this uh, data has been arrived at. In short, this is based on four pillars, namely institutional, social, economic, and physical, which are broken down into 15 categories and 78 indicators. Now, cities have been ranked on the basis of scores out of 100 across 78 indicators, with the institutional and social pillars carrying 25 points each, 5 points for the pillar on economic, and 45 points for the physical pillar. Now, just remember, this is not a one-time exercise. It's not as if we had conducted the exercise now and this is over. This is a st story which is going to be continuing. It will unfold. And as cities and municipal uh, bodies and urban local bodies compete under different examination, there's a Swachhta Sarvekshan. The first was carried out in 2016. Now we're going to carry out the fourth one in 2019 in January. I am sure this will inculcate in the people and in the concerned urban, local bodies, municipal authorities, a desire to improve on each front. Why does a physical uh, front have 45? Because at the end of the day, you can have all the, uh, uh, you know, other indicators, but if the physical infrastructure is not in place, the rest is not going to be easy. So Delhi, for instance, New Delhi ranks at 65. Now that comes at a sharp contradiction when we compare Mumbai and Delhi. Mumbai is at now rank 3 and New Delhi is at rank 65. Interestingly, New Delhi houses uh, all the bureaucrats, all the ministers of the country, be it the president or the prime minister. Don't you think it's, uh, it's a major uh, sort of a now coming back to the comparison? Uh, Delhi should look at further improvement when it comes to Mumbai because yeah. it's a uh, it's the capital of the country New Delhi houses so many important people and still New Delhi ranks you know, at 65 I, when we compare it against Mumbai which has a lot of slums such as Dharavi etc so you mean to say through this in index that maybe Dharavi is much more livable than New Delhi I, 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 I couldn't possibly disagree with you or agree with you it is precisely because my colleagues and I anticipated the kind of comments you are coming up with, young lady, that we decided to make all the data available and put it in the public domain. There you will find out why under a particular pillar, a particular city, and I'm not going into one or the other, was graded at point X or point Y. Uh, first of all, it's not as if uh, New Delhi is uh, New Delhi is a larger area than uh, the one you described. Mm. Uh, then why did people look at it in a particular way? Why did the scoring take place? And I think uh, much of what you said, uh, from my point of view as a very proud Delhiite, will hopefully result. I was born here. I was born here. I've lived most of my life here, except when I was uh, on professional assignments outside. 
this is the provides the encouragement to go up the ranking now i i give you the example of uh, gurugram gurgaon erstwhile it came up 300 places from the second to the third uh, 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 listing it was at something like 300 uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Gaziabad. Gaziabad. It came uh, from three hundred and fifty-six. Three hundred and fifty-six to thirty-eight. More than three hundred and ten or something. So these are these are possibilities which are always there, but we did not want in any of these cases to keep back or hold back the data. we want the data to be out in the uh, public domain so that there is a critical evaluation of that data so people will look at it and they will hopefully come to the correct explanation moving away from the uh, ease of living index uh, two other areas which your ministry is now looking at is the concern of the home buyers and also the implementation of rera so uh, firstly on the concern of home buyers recently we saw the amrapali case also where nbcc also uh, tried to come forward to help the home buyers what do you think home buyers how soon home buyers in specific cases such as jp amrapali etc should see a relief coming in for them let me tell you absolutely uh, categorically that my ministry is committed to finding a solution for the home buyers and finding it quickly despite all the constraints that we are facing you know if it were left to me i would give you the solution straight away but there are a few issues involved land is a state subject number 1 number 2 most of the home buyers have taken their specific issues with the builders and the promoters to the apex court the honorable supreme court many of these cases are being heard by the honorable supreme court you refer to one in particular i would um, urge you to see the order of the honorable supreme court in that particular case they have been they have they have been they provided full some praise for um, the um, particular agency uh, which has been asked to uh, think because you know at the end of the day if there is a default and somebody has to do something somebody else has to step forward but it can only be done with the consent and at the express uh, uh, instruction of the supreme court i can't put a timeline on it but if you are asking me about that particular case i think the uh, that agency wanted the two months time to make a survey but the honorable supreme court directed it be done within one month so let the report come in and let the supreme court then take cognizance of the report and i think we'll get action thereafter so what about implementation of rera well, that, is still, that is still that is still under works so not I, m- I, many I, cities have uh, no. uh, implemented rera though they are sl- uh, slowly and steadily doing that uh, when will we see india completely uh, on rera rera fight, rera fight. no look first of all uh, rera is one year old but within that one year we have spent nearly 6 7 months fighting a strong legal challenge to rera the supreme court had directed the mumbai high court to deal with that we su- we succeeded in battling that challenge now the state authorities each state again land land is a state subject the rera authority has to be set up by the state government i am very happy that we are moving in that direction i have been constantly writing to the chief ministers to my counterparts in the state government and uh, don't judge a piece of legislation which is only one year old and which is new don't judge it by standards of uh, let's say uh, whether it was an old legislation which has not been it's 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 falling into place Uh, there were problems between rera and the um, uh, ibc uh, we've dealt with those there were problems related to the status of home buyers we passed an ordinance and then we've converted it into legislation also mm-hmm. so this is all work in progress i hope by the time we meet next uh, i can then report that almost all the states have uh, complied with the requirements of rera and set up the requisite mechanisms my last question to you sir recently you took a meeting of uh, all the real estate developers where finance minister was supposed to join but due to time constraints he could not uh, what are the main concerns of uh, home buyers and what sort of a relief are they seeking from the government and what co- how soon can we see a help coming to rescue them so that home buyers can get their due first of all let me correct you i did not convene the meeting 
it's the Honorable Finance Minister who convened the meeting. I was an invitee because the Honorable Finance Minister was called away uh, on account of uh, pressing parliament business. I presided over the meeting. All the issues that we've just discussed pertaining to home buyers, all the other issues, the concerned officials responded. And I think um, as soon as um, the Honorable Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jaitley, is back in uh, I think he, as you know, he uh, came for the uh, vote on the uh, Deputy Speaker. So when Arunji is back, I think we'll follow up on some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you for talking to CNBC TV18. So that was clearly uh, H.S. Puri talking to us and saying that the government is committed towards uh, the home buyers and getting their due. And yes, on the recently launched uh, the Most Livable Index where we saw Pune topping the ranks.